The Fourier transform is uh, one of the most important algorithms in signal processing and perhaps the most important algorithm in uh, time frequency based analyses. Um, but the Fourier transform is actually not this uh, weird, complex, sophisticated um, uh, algorithm. In fact, the Fourier transform is fairly straightforward to understand and even to implement. Um, and in fact, there's really only kind of 2.5 things that you need to know in order to understand uh, not only how the Fourier transform works, but how to implement it yourself in MATLAB. Um, the first thing you need to know is about sine waves, and this we covered in the previous lecture. The kind of uh, 1.5th thing that you need to know is about complex numbers and complex sine waves. Um, but I think we can kind of skip over this for now. I think you can still understand the Fourier transform without really having a good grasp of the importance of complex numbers, and we will get back to that point later. And the second thing that you need to know to understand the Fourier transform is the dot product. And that is the focus of this lecture. The dot product is important not only for the Fourier transform, but also is the, uh, the basis, the foundation for many other um, algorithms and analysis techniques um, uh, for example, convolution. And convolution is one of the main methods that we will use for um, time frequency decomposition. And just to foreshadow a little bit where this is going, um, we will learn about this more in the, in the next lecture, but the, the way that the Fourier transform works, or here, right, the discrete time Fourier transform, is basically by comparing your signal, your EEG data, to sine waves of different frequencies. And the way that we implement this comparison between these two time series is via the dot product. So that's what we need the dot product for in the Fourier transform. So just so you can see where this is uh, going. So before I tell you about the, um, the dot product and how it's computed and how to think about it, um, we need to learn a little bit about uh, vectors. So um, there are two different ways of thinking about vectors or conceptualizing vectors. There's a, a more algebraic interpretation and there's a more geometric interpretation. These are both just diff slightly different ways of thinking about the same thing. And uh, you will learn that sometimes in some situations it's more useful to think about vectors in a more algebraic sense and sometimes it's more useful to think about them in a more geometric sense. So it's good to um, appreciate uh, both interpretations. Um, in an algebraic sense, a vector is just a collection of numbers. It's just um, a bunch of numbers that are kind of uh, organized into an array. And so here we have a vector, um, one, two. So this is just a collection of two numbers. There are two elements. Um, so this is the first element and the second element. And these are um, often uh, referred to as dimensions. So this would be the first dimension and the second dimension. And so this is a two-dimensional vector, but it's really just a collection of, of numbers, just an ordered collection of numbers. Okay, so we can also think about a vector in a more geometric sense. And here we can think about a vector as, as an address or a location, a coordinate of a point in, a, um, in some space. And the number of dimensions of that space correspond to the number of dimensions or the number of elements in the vector. And so here we have a nice Cartesian plane. You can imagine this is the x-axis and the y-axis. And now the vector 1, 2 can also be represented as a, as a coordinate that's defined by 1 over on this axis and 2 up on this axis. And we can take this even one step further and think about this coordinate as reflecting the endpoint of a line that goes from the origin to that point. This is a little bit of a physics interpretation as well, that we have a, um, uh, a vector with a particular magnitude and a particular direction or an orientation or, or an angle. Um, uh, we will see when, when we learn about uh, complex numbers and extracting information, um, power and phase information out of the result of Fourier transform and from complex wavelet convolution, that this interpretation is, is very useful. This interpretation becomes a very um, powerful way to think about um, time frequency based analyses. Nonetheless, uh, these two interpretations of a vector are really just two different ways of thinking about the same thing. 
Of course, vectors are not limited to two dimensions. We can also have a three-dimensional vector, for example. And so now um, here is three numbers, and here is a coordinate in a three-dimensional space. So we can call these the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, but these are just arbitrary labels. But the point is that this collection of numbers can also be represented as a coordinate in a three-dimensional space. Um, and we can also think about that coordinate as being the endpoint of a line going from the origin to that um, point. So you can probably imagine that vectors are not limited to uh, one, two, or three dimensions. Vectors can have any number of dimensions, uh, although they have to be uh, uh, integer uh, dimensions. Um, but of course, after three dimensions, it gets very difficult to conceptualize and certainly to draw what it would look like to be a, a coordinate in a 150 dimensional space. Nonetheless, uh, the, the concept um, still holds. The concept is, is still valid. The interpretation is still useful. And in fact, um, later on in EEG data analyses, you will learn that it's sometimes useful to think about um, uh, EEG data in terms of um, in terms of, of vectors, either the, the sort of algebraic interpretation or the geometric interpretation. For example, if you look at a topographical map, uh, the activity at different electrodes at a single time point or in a single frequency band, um, if you have 64 electrodes, so you have data at, at 64 points, you can think of those 64 values as being in, um, in a vector. So I have a 64-dimensional uh, vector that is a representation of the um, topographical map of activity. And you can also, this gets a little bit wacky, but try to think about this. You can also try to imagine a 64-dimensional space where the, um, all, the combination of all of the uh, voltage values at all the different electrodes is one coordinate in that 64-dimensional um, space. Okay, I know it's, a, it's fun to think about, and uh, but it actually is a useful representation, particularly when uh, doing more sophisticated or more advanced analyses, trying to um, compare the relationships between different uh, topographical maps uh, at different uh, time points or different frequency bands. Okay, so now we know um, something about vectors, and now we are ready to uh, to learn about the dot product. The dot product is really just a way of comparing two vectors or trying to find a mapping between uh, two vectors. So here we have um, two vectors. These are four element vectors or four dimensional vectors. And what we want is to, um, or what the dot product is going to give us is a single number that reflects the relationship between these two vectors. Okay, so the dot product, uh, oh, and, and similar to how we can think about um, vectors, either in an algebraic sense or in a geometric sense, we can also think about the dot product in an algebraic sense or in a geometric sense. And in different situations, it will be more useful to conceptualize the dot product in an algebraic way. And in other situations, it will be more useful to conceptualize the dot product in a geometric way. So this is the... Um, the algebraic uh, interpretation of the dot product and the way of thinking about the dot product. So computing the dot product is very straightforward. Um, it involves just um, multiplying each element in the two vectors pointwise and then summing them up. So to compute the dot product between these two vectors, we just multiply 1 times 1 plus 2 times 4 plus 4 times 3 plus 5 times 7 and uh, that simplifies to 56. So now this is one single number that tells us something about the relationship between these two vectors. Needless to say, um, in order for the dot product to be defined between these two vectors, the two vectors have to have the same number of elements. So if this one had a, a 10 over here, uh, then you could not compute the dot product between these two vectors because you would you would have nothing in this vector to multiply against the last number in this, uh, in this uh, vector. Okay, so what does 56 mean? It can, without knowing the units of this, without having other vectors to, uh, to relate this value to, it can be a little bit difficult to uh, 
interpret this number on its own. Uh, but this number can be very useful when interpreted relative to uh, the dot product with other vectors. And so here we have two pairs of uh, vectors. These are each um, two element vectors or two dimensional vectors. And you can see that these two pairs of vectors are almost exactly the same. The only difference is that this um, four has a negative sign in front of it and this is a positive four. And so their dot products here work out to minus seven and nine and, and plus nine. So you might be wondering why this is and why, why uh, are these numbers similar in magnitude but totally opposite in sign. So what does that mean and how do we interpret this difference between um, the dot product uh, where the first vector is identical and the second vector is very similar that it's just flipped on one uh, axis so it's just a negative sign here okay so to understand this this is where the um, geometric interpretation of the dot product uh, becomes uh, useful so now of course I chose these uh, this example to contain um, two-dimensional vectors on purpose so we can represent these three distinct vectors as um, as uh, lines in a two-dimensional space and so here's the, the vector one two the yellow uh, vector and the red vector and the blue vector and so now you can see that the the geometric difference between these two pairs of vectors so yellow to blue versus yellow to red is something related to the angle so from yellow to blue this is a very acute angle uh, they're very close to each other, so that gets a positive number. And um, the the yellow to the red uh, vector, they have an obtuse angle, so it's greater than 90 degrees. Uh, these vectors are pointing very far apart from each other, and now the uh, dot product is, is negative. And so there is, in fact, a non-trivial relationship between the sign of the dot product and the angle of, uh, or the angle between the two vectors, um, and that looks something like this. So when there is um, an acute angle between the two vectors, so an angle less than 90 degrees, the dot product is going to be greater than zero. When the, dot pro uh, sorry, when the angle between the two vectors is exactly 90 degrees, when there's a right angle between the two vectors, the dot product is going to be exactly zero. And when the dot product, uh, or sorry, when the angle between the two vectors is greater than 90 degrees, then the dot product is uh, is negative it's going to be less than zero and so this also um, from this figure we can also see the geometric interpretation of the dot product and what you can think about uh, when uh, the way to think about a dot product in this geometric sense is that you want to find the projection of one vector onto the other vector and the way you do this is by um, kind of drawing a line from the end of one vector down to the other vector such that that line um, uh, forms a right angle with the with the second vector. Another way that people have um, uh, thought about this or explain this is if you imagine that uh, that you know this is this is the surface of the earth and this is where it's midday on the equator and so the sun is exactly up here and now the sun is shining down and this vector could be a wall or something and the shadow this would be the shadow that's cast by the sun onto onto this surface so it comes down exactly perpendicular such that uh, the projection here goes to, uh, forms a right angle with the second vector so and when the angle between these two vectors is less than 90 degrees um, then uh, and then the dot product is positive, it's greater than zero. And now you can see that the when the two vectors are um, have a 90 degree angle between them, the projection of the first angle uh, vector onto the second vector is exactly zero. There is there is no projection, there's no non-zero component of this vector that can be projected onto this vector, at least in this perpendicular sense. And this is why the dot product is zero. There is no relationship between these two vectors. We can say that these two vectors are orthogonal to each other. And now uh, when, the, when the angle between the two vectors is greater than 90 degrees, um, in fact, there is no projection of this first vector onto the second vector because it's sort of bent backwards. 
Um, and so here what you do is just imagine extending the second vector out in, into the opposite uh, direction such that you actually can define a, um, a projection. And this is why the projection gets a negative sign because we are going, you know, you can think of it as, as we're going backwards or if we have to flip this vector um, backwards in the negative direction in order to define a uh, projection from the first vector down onto the second vector. So this gives us a dot product less than zero or a negative dot product. So I hope that gives you a um, geometric intuition for um, for how to conceptualize dot products and when the dot products are are negative and positive and zero. Um, the geometric um, uh, way of computing dot products is, or defining dot products is that it is the uh, the magnitudes of the two um, vectors, so these um, hor um, uh, vertical bars uh, um, indicate the, the magnitude or the length from zero to the end point. The length of that vector is the magnitude. Um, times the cosine of the angle between them. Uh, I don't want to dwell on this too much. It is formally equivalent to, um, to, to uh, this algebraic um, uh, computation where we just sum all the, the element-wise multiplications. Um, but just to have it here for uh, sort of uh, more formal reasons. You can see that um, the, uh, when the, the angle between the two vectors is 90 degrees and the cosine is going to be zero. And so then this whole equation is zero. And that's why you have a zero dot product when the angle between the two vectors is, um, is 90 degrees. And uh, again, um, so uh, just to uh, reiterate and, and foreshadow where this is going with the dot product, when we have these two uh, vectors, when we are computing the Fourier transform, we have our EEG signal and we have the sine wave, we can think about these two um, time series as, as two vectors. So the vector of EEG data, the vector of a sine wave, and we can think about these as a collection of numbers. We can also think about these, let's say this is 640 time points. We can also think about these two vectors as two uh, lines in a 640 dimensional space. And what we want to do in the Fourier transform is compute the mapping between these two uh, vectors. And so this is my uh, illustration of how, just to remind you that the sine wave is, is actually discretized. It's just a bunch of points. It is the same number of points as the EEG data, of course, because to compute the dot product, the number of uh, elements in the two vectors have to be the same. And then what happens in the Fourier transform is that each, um, each time point or the data at each time point in the EEG data uh, is multiplied by um, the value of the sine wave at the corresponding time point. And then we sum up all of these pointwise multiplications, and this is how we get the frequency specific information per frequency. So that's um, uh, just to give you a bit of a taste of what's to come. And this uh, idea of how this algorithm works is something that will be um, unpacked and developed in much more detail in uh, the next lecture.